Thursday, June the 22nd, 2023. Good evening. Welcome along to Business Today. I'm Jerome Paul Sonko in here to give you all the latest from the world of business in your daily report. Now, kicking it off with the Entebbe Airport, which is pursuing recovery as the Entebbe International Airport has recorded 87% for post-COVID-19 recovery rate after hitting between 4,000 to 4,020 commercial passengers. The Civil Aviation Authority's Director General, Fred Bamoiseje, says that the number of passengers dropped to as low as 50, uh, but the current figures show that the airport is on the road to recovery. A great show for you. During COVID-19, Entebbe International Airport remained closed to commercial passenger traffic from July 2020 to September 30th, 2020, with only cargo operations, emergency flights, and repatriation flights permitted. This largely had a negative impact on the industry's aeronautical and non-aeronautical revenue, which largely accounts for the shortfalls in the period. Bar aviation. During the aviation expo, an opportunity to further bridge the gap between the aviation industry and the general public, Fred Bamwesje, the Director General of the Civil Aviation Authority, says that the Entebbe International Airport is expressing post-COVID-19 growth and that they can handle between 4,000 to 4,020 commercial passengers. Ever since those very bad years of COVID, 2020-2021, we have seen aviation industry trying to come back, though not to those levels of pre-COVID, but at least we see ourselves, well as actually pre-COVID figures, we were having an average of 5,000 passengers, at least in our main international airport here at Entebbe. That number went as low as 50 passengers, in fact, as low as zero, at least for commercial passengers. Then we came to 50 passengers, we came to 1,000 passengers. Now we are in between 4,000 and 4,020 passengers. Captain Aziz Sentamu, the head of Uganda Professional Pilots Association, says that away from COVID effects, they are still grappling with the poor mindset, which is hindering domestic flights. So the general public needs to change that perception and embrace it. Because you see, don't just look at how much you're spending, but how, what are you getting? Because you're saving time. That's why we have some people who fly in from Arua every day come to Entebbe, do business, and go back with companies such as Bar Aviation, Aerolink Uganda, and they do it almost on a daily. So it's worth every penny you put in. And if you go to countries like South Sudan, people use planes to go for Barrio. We are just too happy, and we are going to continue doing this to make sure the aviation industry is better understood. People participate in it. It develops our country. And one thing you must realize that aviation has the cap capacity to link even landlocked countries to other areas, even in a much faster way. Right Honorable Robina Nabanja, who was the chief guest at the expo, pledged government continuous support towards the Entebbe International Airport by upgrading six more air drums to improve on the number of domestic flights. The government of Uganda, headed by His Excellency Yoweri Kaguta Museven, established 13 air drums. 13 in strategic locations across the country to encourage domestic flights. And I'm telling you today that government has put aside some money in the next financial year to upgrade six of these airlines. Data from the Civil Aviation Authority report 2021 indicated that during the period of 2017-2021, domestic passengers grew at an average annual rate of 15.4%. Domestic passengers had been estimated to grow at 5% during the same period.
The growth of the domestic traffic was as a result of increased non-governmental organization activities in northern Uganda coupled with improved tourism operations. However, domestic passengers were heavily affected during the year 2020 and 2021 due to COVID-19 pandemic. Pedson Mumbere Smart 24 TV Business Today. All right, now, earlier today, esteemed Minister for East African Community Affairs, Rebecca Alituala Kadaga, unveiled the illuminating vision of East African Communities' regional integration, and she further emphasized its vital importance in molding Uganda's economic panorama. Now, besides that, she pointed out challenges posed by the central bank governors who set a simultaneous convergence criterion for all member states, uh, terming it as a stumbling block against the monetary union. Now in this report, we look at the common currency and the East African community stalemate. In quest for regional integration, Uganda continues to expand its trade horizons. The nation benefits from a wider market for its exports and access to diverse products and services from neighboring countries. With harmonized trade regime, reduced trade barriers, and encouraging cross-border investments, regional integration paves way for increased market access and economic growth, strengthening regional supply chains. The, as a country with the landlocked, it's important that we have this integration. Uh, if you can imagine being able to move from Mombasa to the port of Matadi in the Atlantic as a citizen of East Africa. If you're a truck driver, you drive from Mombasa through these countries up to the Atlantic. Our traders, instead of going to first to the Cape of Good Hope, going to Egypt in order to reach Europe, you go straight to the Atlantic. So this is part of the importance of the need for regional integration. It's not just a matter for East Africa, but uh, the African people have for long wanted us to have a United States of Africa, but uh, because of our political differences, the French speakers, the Tagu with the English speakers, the Portuguese speakers are also there, the Spanish speakers are also on this continent. It was difficult to form a, a common government at the same time. So, in what we call the Lagos Plan of Action, it was agreed that we establish regional blocks, regional economic blocks first. That's, you have the Powers, you have Sadiq. We have uh, the countries of the Maghreb region, the southern community. The customs union eliminated the tariffs, the taxes, among goods which are produced within the partner states, such that the goods which are produced in Uganda can move freely to the other countries and vice versa. That is, that is the perfect thing that is supposed to happen. But as I will be sharing with you, sometimes there are uh, problems that arise and it doesn't happen that way. Another pivotal aspect of regional integration is the establishment of a monetary union. This entails adopting a common currency, facilitating seamless financial transactions, and fostering monetary stability across member states. Additionally, it can reduce transaction costs, exchange rate risks, and promote cross-border investments. However, according to Right Honorable Rebecca Kadaga, Minister for EAC Affairs, the criteria set by the central bank's governors to be made by member states at the same time is a hurdle. The other area which is not moving as well as it should and with the people for East Africa anxious to get handled is the of the monetary union. You have been told that it has a common currency for the whole of East Africa but uh, now we have a stumbling block called the governors of the central banks. 
the set of convergence, what they call the convergence criteria, which you must all meet, all of us at the same time. How can the convergence meet the criteria, what they have just joined? So we have that problem, but uh, there are certain blocks and bureaucratic uh, activities which are making it difficult for us to start the monetary union. Recognizing that youths constitute a significant portion of Uganda's population, equipping them with necessary skills and knowledge for gainful employment encourages their active participation in the economy. By harnessing the potential of the youth, Uganda is fostering a vibrant and dynamic workforce that will drive the nation towards sustainable development. Bronya Katsime, Smart24 TV, Business Today. And our next report turns to the Uganda Road Fund funding deficit. As the Uganda Road Fund was allocated 401 billion shillings for the financial year 2023-2024. Uh, this is the money that will be used for repairing and maintenance of roads that are in poor state in various parts of the country. A section of legislators have expressed their dissatisfaction with the little money allocated to a fund which collects revenue that amounts to trillion shillings. We have details in this report. Uganda Road Fund is a government body tasked with funding routine and periodic maintenance of Uganda's public roads. The organization was established in 2008 by a parliamentary statute and raises funds in a variety of ways, independent of conventional government taxing schemes. According to legislators, this fund collects revenue amounting to 3 trillion shillings, however very little of that money is actually dispersed, making it challenging for the country's accountable maintenance organizations to maintain the roads. The road fund collects funds that come from the road fund accumulate to about 3 trillion. But government only commits and releases 467 billion. Can you imagine? For example, I am the chairman of the road fund committee in my district. We receive between 30 to 80 million shillings in a quarter. And that means almost 200 to 300 million in the entire financial year. It's good that the government has allocated and committed itself that on, on top of this, uh, 1 billion shillings will go to each district. But we wait to see the budget performance. Normally, they excite us with big allocations during the budgeting, but when it comes to release, we find that the budget is performing at 40%, just like you, you, you have been hearing about the parish model. So we are also waiting to see whether the one billion extra for roads is released such that we can massively tackle the roads for the community access and connectivity roads in the rural areas. Honorable Palimwezo says most of the East African countries have operationalized the road fund and that is why they have better roads compared to Ugandan ones which take years to be worked on. Yeah, Rwanda, this fund is operational. They have been able to make their roads because they have that second generation fund for making roads in Tanzania. That's what was working. That's the reason you cannot see such scenarios in Tanzania. Because roads connect students to schools, connect farmers to markets, patients to hospitals. Road infrastructure is crucial for a country like Uganda, where road transit accounts for 90% of the transportation system. The situation gets worse during the rainy seasons, as many of the roads in Kampala City are full with potholes, and the ones leaking to community centers are hardly maintained. Members of parliament are happy with the 1 billion shillings allocated to each district from the road fund, but caution Ministry of Finance about the ease of releasing this money. Some of us who worked as district councillors, chairpersons of districts before we came here, we are aware about the problems that the districts face, especially uh, on infrastructure development. So the passing of money for roads comes in handy, uh, especially as part of the support of the parish development model. Because once we spur people, into a lot of production. Then whatever they produce, uh, agri uh, agricultural and animal, animal products, all need to be moved to markets. And they need 
good roads right from the base of the production up to the final destination. That's why we have voted money into uh, the road fund to help market the production that will have been generated using the PDM money. Last month, government tabled a loan request of 2.26 trillion shillings sold from World Bank and Agency Francie du Development to work on the Greater Kampala Metropolitan Infrastructure Development Program. If this loan is approved, roads in Wakiso, Mpiji, Mukono, Kira, among others, will be worked on. Samlanifa, Smart24 TV, Business Today. All right, now in the other news, the high lending rates have persisted. As following a fear for a long inflationary period, the Monetary Policy Committee of England's Central Bank has decided to raise the key lending rate to 5%, the highest since February this year and dating back to 2008. Now, the consistent revision since December 2021 uh, does respond to the soaring cost of living, which is expected which is expected to the soaring cost of living, uh, which is expected to persist for a longer period to come. We have details. According to Jean Dukamushaba, the director of Farm to Table Limited, such a training serves as a farmer ground day in the district that always focuses on evaluating different practices and challenges faced by farmers in previous seasons that require revision. Tukamushaba further adds that the main motive of training is to tackle the challenge of low crop yield that farmers face after investing a lot of money and labor in crop production. We are trying to tackle the challenge of... Uh raw crop yields. The farmers invest in a lot of money in labor, in expensive seeds, in medicines, but in the long run they don't harvest the required yield. So we come in to train them to boost their yield and uh, to help them improve on their Valeria Kabuye, a member of Toyembeche Farmers in Ramutasia, says there is no longer great productivity in crop production like it used to be back in the day, blaming this on land degradation. She also says that their group has gained great production in the previous seasons because of the use of fertilizers. <laughs> The way crops used to grow back in the day is different from the way they do lately. For example, these days we could harvest bags for sorghum, but now you cannot get a full sack, even with beans. The best one can harvest is a basket of 10 kilos. Amos Tonjirwe, the parish chief of Chitojo Ward in Bubare Town Council, says that currently seasons are unpredictable and this has been a major cause of loss among its local farmers. Tonjirwe urged that the use of chemicals, especially fertilizers, is the way to go as far as crop production is concerned, saying that this will assist in crop production on exhausted land. I well understand that these very chemicals are going to increase farmers' yields. And they have come in just because those very partners have realized that the soil has completely been exhausted. Uh, meaning when a farmer go ahead using those very fertilizers and chemicals, automatically he's going to come up with some good yields. You find there is some good smile on the face of every farmer. The current market is being penetrated with quick maturing and climate change resilient food crops that lower risk of food insecurity among farming households dependent on commerce. Timoni Nuomukama, the community project manager, says there is a great need for farmers to consider investing in crop and soil research before planting to fit in the economical chain of production. So research helps us, helps the farmer to keep updated, to keep up to date with the market with the available technologies, which in turn uh, will help him to, to produce for the market. And then, of course, uh, it all translates into uh, increased incomes uh, for our farming communities. Mm. Alan Mohosi, a fertilizer expert with African Fertilizer Agrobusiness Partnership, says that the soil productivity of soil has been exhausted and that the use of fertilizers in the right procedure is the way to go. Mohosi further asks farmers to always use the fertilizers as instructed to get better yields, saying that some farmers wrongly apply the fertilizers.
issue of farmers applying uh, wrongly. We tell you like apply in the soil around the roots of the plant, then a farmer goes, apply, uh, uses uh, a knapsack, puts a few cages of fertilizer, a bus of fertilizer or planting fertilizer, and goes spraying his crop. Uh, also, it is really a challenge and it is a weakness from farmers uh, and I urge farmers not to continue using that mode of application. Safe farming and the careful usage of agrochemicals is expected to foster production among its farmers for land that got exhausted due to over-cultivation. Norbert Nyamhachi, Masa Katsimi for Smart24 TV, Business Today. Well, apologies for that report. Uh, this particular one that has just aired is uh, relating, is rotating around low productivity and fertilizer use as uh, the Rubanda farmers, as you've been able to, to see there, uh, receive training on fertilizer usage, disease identification and better farming practices. And of course, something to do with Farm to Table Limited and its partners, uh, including uh, Delphi, Singeta, then the African Fertilizer Agribusiness Partnership, as well as the Export Trading Group, were all the ones that hosted the one-day workshop to ensure that this is worked upon. And over 100 of farmers attended this particular workshop. Now, uh, heading back to our high lending rates uh, report, uh, whereby following fear of a long inflationary period, the Monetary Policy Committee of England's Central Bank has decided to raise the key lending rate to 5%, uh, the highest since February this year and it does take uh, date back to 2008. The consistent revision since December 2021 responds to the soaring cost of living, expected to persist for a longer period to come. This is an international report. Bank of England has declared an increase in its benchmark lending rate from 4.5% to 5%, its highest since 2018. Despite disagreements over its effectiveness, interest rates continue to be a major measure used to reduce inflation. Former Deputy Governor of Bank of England for Monetary Policy, Sir Charlie Bin, told press that he would probably vote a 0.5% rise if he were on committee because the last meeting was unquestionably bad for inflation. Well, I, I, I would to a degree defend the bank because of course the main reason we have high inflation is because of the external uh, price shocks associated with the war in Ukraine, the rising gas prices, global food prices, uh, also uh, supply chain pressures as economies reopened after the pandemic. But that said, I think they were um, a little bit behind the curve and they certainly persisted too long. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he will recommit to having inflation by the end of year and he feels a deep moral responsibility, making sure the money earned holds its value. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt appeared to back further interest rate raises, saying he would not hesitate to support the Bank of England as it seeks to squeeze inflation out of the economy. Yeah, I think what the Chancellor was saying is that inflation is the challenge that we must confront. Obviously, monetary policy, interest rates are a decision for the Bank of England, so it wouldn't be right for me to comment on that. But look, I set out five priorities. Halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt, cut waiting lists, and to stop the boats. The first of those is to halve inflation. That's the thing that I want to make sure we deliver. We're, we're taking the difficult decisions. Uh, at the top of our mind are families, uh, businesses, people who are worried about jobs, about bills to pay. Uh, we want to do what we can to help them, but we recognise the biggest single thing we can do is to help the Bank of England bring down inflation. UK aims at reducing inflation by half to 5% by the end of the year. The bank's official's long-term aim has been set at 2%. However, getting the inflation in prison back into the bottle is proving troublesome for the Bank of England, as Rob Morgan of the investment company Charles Stanley states. The bank is forced to continue raising interest rates since, since price momentum is constantly exceeding forecasts and solid wage data. There will now be incredibly fraught discussions among the nine members of the Monetary Policy Committee, including the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, about whether or not they should go for half a percentage point, so a rise from 4.5% to 5%. This is the Bank of England's what we call the base rate. It sets the mm. tone for all other interest rates, by definition in the economy, are above that rate. So when the Bank of England base rate goes up by half a percent, you can expect most variable rate mortgages to go up by around a half a percent, plus mm. the mortgage companies. Yeah. 
And well, with that report, we now head to our commercial break. But when we return, we have more insightful discussions rotating around the numbers in the Albertine region. Stick around. Driving business. Cooking oil, no other makes a meal so sweet and scrumptious. The taste of Uganda. Luxury redefined at Sea Sand Hotel as you indulge in the splendor of elegant living, feed for the royalty that you are. Step into comfort, pampering and blissful customer-centric service as you select from our range of comfy, exquisite living quarters furnished to meet with your royal preference. Surrounded by scenic beauty, our tropical setting allows you to escape the clamorous odor of city life. Our ambient green gardens will guide you to a place of revitalizing rest. The three-star restaurant caters to your palate, serving your choice menu ranging from exotic cuisines to local delicacies. Our chefs will serve you full course meals for a truly out-of-this-world culinary experience. Our fully stocked bar to wet your throat, from renowned global brand whisks, brandies, jeans, beers and wines to our locally celebrated beverages, you will not lack for any brewage. It's an all-new experience in the East at Seasun Hotel. So visit today at Plot 15 to 19 Spire Road Ginger or contact us on plus 256-751-719-960 and plus 256-785-354-614 for reservations. Seasun Hotels, luxury redefined. Hello tech lovers, the Pixel tablet is here. Is Google back? Wow, we could all be asking the same question. But the Pixel tablet launches today into a field more crowded than ever, priced at £599. It's got the same chip as the company's flagship Pixel 7 smartphones, an 11 inch screen and a bunch of applications optimized to take advantage. But the standout feature is the dock which you slap the tablet onto with some powerful magnets and effectively transforms the device into a home hub. You can see information like time and weather, have it cycle through photos, play music from the inbuilt speakers, control your lights and it's Hey Google 
voice assistant is always listening. Given that ever more muddled space between smartphones and tablets, Google will hope its decision to have it flat with the smart home market proves a masterstroke. Considering its history with new products, we will all know in about two years. Google has a history of killing off products that don't set the world alight. From its Stadia gaming platform to its previous Pixel tablet, it hopes its latest effort will find itself an audience by stuttering the line between the tablet and the home hub. As smartphone screens have gotten bigger and laptops more powerful, tablets have gone through something of an identity crisis. Once pitched as an obvious middle ground between the computer in your pocket and one on your lap, the thinking behind them seems increasingly muddled. There are iPads for people who want a keyboard and powerful processor and those who want a small screen. Samsung, unfortunately, occasionally with a stylus makes tablets while also making phones that fold out into screens even bigger than some tablets and don't forget amazon's various kindos and microsoft's array of surfaces if your head is hurting because of all these features then you're definitely not alone as someone who recently helped research a newly family tablet purchase, it's more difficult than ever to know which models to choose from as you use cases vary so wildly. But that hasn't stopped Google from developing the latest Google Pixel tablet, which comes with a twist. But can it find an audience? Smart 24, driving business. All right, we'll be back from the break and many thanks for sticking around uh, to wherever you are. And now we turn our focus on the numbers in the Alba time. As mid-2025, the quoted time frame for Uganda's fast oil closes in and the efforts tended to the sector in sustainable petroleum uh, program in the upcoming fiscal year. Now, the development in the Alba time graben is unprecedented. Besides that, now Ronan Ahabwe is joining us tonight from the Graben for a better insight into exactly what the Kingfisher and Telenga propose for the future. Good evening, Rona. Many thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for having, having me and good evening to our viewers. Okay. Thank you for having um, me. Just briefly, can you tell our viewers where you are currently so that we can get a clear picture of uh, the entire situation? Okay, so currently I'm in Hoima City, quite a city actually, because every time I get here there is a new hotel. I guess it's the old city, like they say. And uh, currently uh, you, you've been in Chikube for, uh, now for the start. Can you paint for us a picture how the Kingfisher stands to date? Okay, so the Kingfisher project uh, is part of the upstream projects that are being developed by Sinok Uganda. So what you need to know is it is going to be producing about 40,000 barrels of crude oil at peak per day, going to be drilled from four well pads from four 31 wells, oil wells. 31 oil wells are going to be drilled from four well pads. That's apparently to the new technology they have, so they can drill that much of oil wells from just four well pads. But what is on course? What is happening and what is the current picture that I could paint out? If you recall very well, uh, His Excellency launched the spudding of drilling at this same project, the Kingfisher project, if you're able to see some of the pictures. So earlier this year, February, when they, the, the, drill, the drill came in, in last year around December, in February he launched the drilling uh, or the spudding of the Kingfisher project. So what is happening right now on, on scene or what you should know? 
Right now, drilling is on course. Drilling is active. When we ask the engineers, of course the drill is, is, is soundproof, you cannot hear anything, that's how environmental friendly it is. But I, I think the biggest misconception or what could be out there too, is that when you hear drilling you could think that they are pulling out the crude. No, they are drilling for data acquisition, they are drilling to get information or pipelines and the explosives that are going to bust that pipeline and the oil will be able to come out through those pipelines. So they're drilling for data acquisition. Sound blacks, uh, they were just the rounds of the CPF. So they're just drilling for data acquisition, okay. for clarity. Okay, now when you come to think of it here, Rona, uh, 31 well pads for Tilenga and uh, 10 of those in Maction Falls National Park. I will stand to be corrected from that as well. How environmentally critical is uh, the Kingfisher project? Well, quite frankly, the, uh, any project of such a magnitude as she has to be carried out. The environmental social impact assessment has to be carried out. So what, what we saw here or today was quite, um, everything is on course. They are drilling sustainably, so we should be able to see sustainable petroleum development. We have not seen anything that is quite, that would seem hazardous or anything. And if there is any spillover, of course, I'll be there to report. Okay, and when you look at the industrial area and uh, the central processing facility, uh, which are a pool of jobs for the skilled and non-skilled labor, obviously, for Uganda, and what is the uptake so far in regards to your observation? Well, CINOC, uh, for instance, in regards to local content, um, it hired the Excel Construction Company, which we all know is a Ugandan company, but then it also hired the China, the Chinese Offshore Oil Fields Limited, the one that is doing the drilling uh, specifically. So in regards to construction and awarding of contracts, it is between uh, Excel Construction Company that is developing one well pad two, and the Chinese Offshore Limited that is drilling that same well pad. In regards to the CPF, uh, they are just uh, leveling ground, and once the contractor is, at, is, is known, then it, that contract will be awarded. All right, now, speaking of contracts, nine key contract areas on the Tilenga end, and for uh, a look at the local content and yeah. the other affiliate players, who exactly uh, does Sinoc yes. have on board in regards to one construction, uh, well pads, camps, plus other developments, for instance? Maybe to give an overview in regards to national local content and contract awarding, currently uh, $7 billion worth of contracts have been awarded for all the projects in the Albertine Graben. That is Silenga and Kingfisher. And $1.8 billion has only been awarded to Ugandan companies. So if you can see, that is quite a low number, $1.8 billion yes. to, to just local companies. But then what they have told them, usually and concurrently in one of those stakeholder engagements because Ugandans are really interested but the problem is financing. They cannot be on cost because of financing. So what I've told them is to join joint venture partners like what you are seeing in Tilenga. Total, Enoch and, and, and McDermott. So or joint venture partners, if you cannot afford to bid, at least join with someone who has more money so that you ca your, your stake together can be able to compete to get a bid. Because at the end of the day, these people want people that can develop, people that have the resources. Like the energy minister recently said, we want to move when they were launching the compensation houses. So there is really so much in regards to financing. I think the Ugandan companies have to step up. But in regards to the community, maybe to give paint for you a picture, uh, the skilled labor is most of it, the laborers, uh, they are getting them from the host community. If you're able to see the pictures, there is is really so much coexistence between them. That is something that I have mm. not seen in Tilenga. And I think if you ask more, I'll be able to, you know, Okay, now let's also try to look at some details that point out, uh, that point out to, uh, to the engineering, procurement, construction, and installation of the Kingfisher oil field production. When you come to think of it, is the joint venture aspect a key takeaway for any local players? Uh, when, when you, you look at... Um, the details that point out uh, the award of engineering, procurement, construction and installation of Kingfisher oil field production to a joint venture between China Offshore Oil Engineering Company and the China Petroleum Engineering and Construction Corporation. Do you think the joint yes. venture is an aspect yes. of a key takeaway for our local players? Well, like I said, mainly it is joint, joint venture partnerships. 
Ugandan companies do not have the capacity, at least from what I gathered. Okay. Financing is the problem. So what they can usually do, in, in perhaps they should mm -hmm. venture in hotels, accommodation, because like I said, every time I come mm -hmm. here, there are new hotels. So they could not be direct linkages, like a job or per se a contract. But what they are doing also, these other partners, like the government and so, they are training young students. Today we are also with students from Akerere, Chambogo, and, 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 and Mkumba University. They really want to be part, as well as uh, Chigumba Institute. They really want to be part in this, in, this, in, the, in this industry. So they are training them to be able to come to the uh, capacity and get these, these jobs. Because the person that spoke to us about the drilling actually has a master's degree okay. in petroleum. So, Sonko, if you were to ask yourself how many people do have master's degree, and, and these people were actually flown out of the country to study these, uh, these, 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 these type of, uh, of, of skills to be able to come and work in the Albert and Graben. Some of this initiative was even by the president himself. So, but I think in the next few years, once we start production, once production is on course, we should be able to see something different because they're really well, training now, let's people. Let's look at the Kaiso Tonya fields. Eh? How critical are these oil blocks? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the information I have is that the Kaiso and the Tonya fields, we should be able to have them on course after the five years of development. There are also potential oil blocks, but they have not mm. yet started exploring them, especially for that uh, Kingfisher project. Okay. And uh, the crude oil pipeline construction has been anticipated yeah. for late this year. From what, uh, from what you've uh, observed so far, how are the preparations? In first, Tilenga, and then uh, at Kingfisher. Well, it is quite different, quite frankly. If I'm, ideally, it is really so different uh, from the Tilenga. First of all, the unique thing about Kingfisher is that the community is not okay. so spread out like Tilenga. The community, if you see the pictures, there is really so much coexistence. And I was like, how is this even possible? Because there is a leveling of ground there, then you can see cattle passing, and then there are, there are communities, they even have market. But maybe, perhaps, it's the type of community that we found. The biggest achievement that this community has been able to record is that initially, before the development of the Kingfisher project, there, there used to be no access from Hoima okay. to Chikube district. It used to take them around two hours to get there. So they built up a road because that, uh, that area is, is in an escarpment. If you have been to Kisoro and perhaps some parts of Busheni, you should know what an ex escarpment looks like. So they have okay. put up an escarpment. It is quite a uh, long, long period. So now the, the road is really clear and, and people have access from Hoima okay, to Chikube. Um, more about Chikube. How does the community differ from Bulisa per se in terms of... Uh, the reception of this particular oil and gas project? Well, in an interview we had with the chairman, at least for him, he has, he has already started to, to, you know, to enjoy the fruits of this. But uh, the, this community, if you have any history in regards to health, it has been one of those communities that have been attacked by cholera, okay. in and out. But for the last two years, uh, Sinok, as part of their CSR, they have put up uh, a water project with 46 taps that are reaching about six villages, mm. six to five villages around that area. So, Korea, they have not heard of Korea. Maybe that is a big milestone for them because poor health, I mean, you have no life and you have no productivity. So, there is no Korea for the last two years. At least that's what I can tell you in regards to that community. But... Um, what should quite be intriguing is that we did not mm. see any fishing okay. on the area. As you can see, there are showers on Lake Albert. Perhaps they have been stopped because there is drilling on course, which I think is quite not fair. But I think I will get more answers in regards to that. But there is no uh, fishing. And, and since it was um, uh, the, the okay. economic activity for, for people like that, there is no fishing. Uh, we didn't see any part of fishing. However, they have, put, they have tried to put for them a central market. Uh, there are some resettlement houses. The biggest investment there is the water to ca try to curb the uh, corridor. So to our viewers, what is there to understand about deco uh, the decommissioning at the end of this particular project? Decommissioning? Yes, yes. Oh yes, the commissioning, uh, it is quite relevant at this time, I would say, because it comes after years of development. You know, this, this, this oil project has a, a phase of about 15 years to 20 years. So it comes after like even 10 years, but it's just there, a mandatory fund from all the developers, including Total and Sinok, but they are supposed to have a decommissioning fund where they are supposed to be putting money. 
in case because oil this oil is not is not infinite it's not permanent okay. it can deplete it can they can tell you that the 6.5 billion barrels that are there they are no longer there of which 1.7 or 1.4 are just recoverable so anything can happen within 5 to 15 to 20 years but that decommissioning fund of course is meant to it's sort of a security for the community of what they have started so that they don't leave the things stagnant it is very mandatory and every developer of this in this Albertan region is supposed to be mm. putting certain money and I think it's not relevant at this time but in years to come it will be a topic okay uh, let's talk the Kabalega airport how special is it and uh, what's going on so far because Ugandans were having their say on social media recently in regards to its progress and um, of course among the social media trends uh, do reveal that it is progressing steadily how is it um, I didn't quite get you the there. The Airport, how special is it and uh, w what's happening? Oh, yeah. okay, the mm. Kabalega. Okay, so we are at the Kabalega International Airport okay. yesterday. Uh, quite a scene, I would say, quite a scene. Initially, it was oh. Kabale International okay. Airport, but they changed it. You know, this place has a historical thing with names. They, they, they are passionate or they are deliberate about the kind of names they give their places. So it is 99% complete. The only thing missing right now is the air traffic controller. That is the only thing missing right now. But right now, it can offload any aircraft with any type of cargo or equipment. You know, initially, not even initially. Its sole purpose is meant to airlift the equipment okay. of the refinery. All right. Yes. Mm. So the refinery, the refinery, we have not even gotten the FID for the refinery, but that one is also on course. But because they realize that they cannot transport easily on road the equipment of refinery, they built that airport. It is just majorly, the major purpose of it is meant to airlift the equipment of the refinery. And then in the next three to four years, the passenger issue can come in, mm. about 50 passengers at peak per hour. So it's, uh, it's an international airport, just like okay. the uh, now, now, how about lastly, if you were to look at the nightlife economy uh, uh, currently, where you are, uh, briefly give us a picture of the nightlife economy and how these particular projects have impacted the socioeconomic trend uh, within these particular communities. But first, uh, the, life, uh, the nightlife economy there currently, what is, uh, what is at stake? What is at stake there? What is at stake? In relation to yeah. or how have the project impacted the socio-economic trend of the communities before we go into the nightlife economy? Well, uh, so really so much is at stake, if maybe that's what you are, you are, you are asking. Uh, a lot of investment has already been put in, and of course, like they always say, for the first, you know, first period, the, the financer, like Total Energies and Sinoc, they are going to have the biggest... Uh, they are going to have the biggest share of the, because it is only fair that they have the biggest chunk, at okay. least from what we have been told, that it is only fair they have the biggest mm -hmm. chunk of the resources that are meant to be developed. But later on in the due course, because this is 6.5 yeah. billion barrels, Zonko, about 1.4 mm -hmm. recoverable. And, 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 and once this crude is, is, is exported through ECOP, and another is transported through Uganda, then we should be able, because oil is a big thing, we okay. should be able to see a change. Uh, lastly, Nahabwe, my question in relation to uh, the nightlife out there. How is it? How is the economy in the night time during such um, projects, if you are to give us a picture? Because we have some Ugandans who may be, ex who may be um, having ideas of coming up there to start up something huge for the nightlife. The yeah. economy here in Hoima, uh, like I said, uh, this city is just growing on people. I think it is a big investment. Most okay. people have realized it. And for the communities, to be honest with you, the, communi the near communities are really not doing so well. If you drive through deep down in Chukube, in Bolisa, if you're going, go, okay. you going there tomorrow, Nyoya, the communities are really still oh. so poor. The, the, biggest, the biggest money is here in Hoima because this is where people come and sleep, oh, okay. the investors. But we really hope by the end of the day, apart from the people that were given houses, the ones that were compensated for with chunks of money, we really hope that there is development in this community because oil is a big resource. Oh, it's okay. a reality. Many thanks for joining us, Nahawe. And um, we want to wish you a very good night with, uh, with the man behind the camera, Solomon. Kindly send regards. 
And well, there you have it, Rona Nahawe Hoima. She was actually giving us a very insightful conversation. I do hope you have enjoyed that one. Very insightful, it did look like, in regards to Uganda's oil and gas progress. But besides that, now we turn our eyes on fostering smallholder farming. In the face of limited funding in the agricultural sector, uh, smallholder farmers anticipated uh, improved policies and access to finance to stamp uh, their unquestionable contribution to global food security. Uganda Farmers Common Voice Platform, an agro-advocacy entity together with Caritas Uganda and Microfinance Support Center recently convened to pronounce the need for proactive agriculture. We have details in this report. Data from Food and Agriculture Organization indicates 80% dominance of sub-Saharan farmland by smallholder farmers and a bigger number of agriculture-linked households. Being smaller holder as a sector contributes 72% of the labor force. Uganda's Farmers Common Voice platform, together with agro-learning stakeholders such as Microfinance Support Center, Caritas and Agriculturalists, convened to demonstrate the need to promote and protect smallholder the farmers whose contribution to the global food security is commendable. It wasn't just about stopping GMO. We were very, very, uh, very, very active in uh, ensuring that the organic policy is passed in this country. We worked very closely with partners like Pelham Uganda, AXA, and other partners, and worked closely with the Ministry of, of, uh, of Agriculture to ensure that at least we have an alternative policy. So it's not just a, enough to say we don't need this, but we are as, actually uh, providing alternatives. Agriculture, unlike trade and manufacturing, attracts limited private sector credit, and such has been the case since November last year, posing clear need for funding intervention. According to the Microfinance Support Center, Tripartite agreement should be considered to bring the sector, government and advocacy in sync. In contrast, key avenues such as agroinsurance haven't been fully exploited despite the existence of a consortium as the factor itself contested in the light of rudimentary agriculture. So actually we should have a, a tripartite arrangement where we sit with your team, with the parish development model and the, the, the microfinance support centre. So we, we, we can't fail to come out with a, a, a good strategy. You know, the, the challenge has been we have been doing it alone. We go alone. As government, we go this side. As a church, we go this side. The other, we do it alone. When we do it alone, it takes us quite a long, a long time. Most of our farmers, you know, um, are smallholder farmers who depend on rain-fed agriculture. So rain may come, it may not come. So therefore, it is very, very important that they, are, they have security you know, of their crop. If we had the insurance, definitely they could be helped uh, during uh, uh, you know, periods of uh, drought, during periods of excessive rainfall where they lose a lot of crop. And uh, as you are aware, uh, even the handling of their produce is, you know, they, they use the rudimentary technologies. You know, sometimes quality is quite often um, compromised. With 1.7 trillion shillings allocated to agro-industrialization, the agro-advocacy group is hopeful that such will be key in influencing improved agricultural practice to pull smallholder farmers into prime competition. In a similar understanding, Caritas Siganda's director, Father Hillary, advises a shift from the dependency syndrome. Whereas we haven't reached the percentage we are still in 3.3, I think 3.37%. But at least in absolute numbers, we are happy to say that this year, as a program, the agro-industrialization program, we are able to get 1.7 trillion. And it's because we have made good noise. Thank you. 12 census. It was 7 million households, farmers, and that makes over 80% of the households in Uganda that are doing farming. And these people really are the reasons why we exist.
Among the numerous sector challenges such as finance and market price fluctuations, Chiboga Woman Member of Parliament barely forgot to point out market access shortages, citing the proposed compulsory milk market through school consumption as unconvincing in the face of key nutrition and market sensitive agro produce. It is a proposal to make milk consumption in schools mandatory to every what? To every student. But at the back of our mind, we know we are somehow creating a market for milk. But we, ha we already have a lot of nutrient dense crops as well. We have soya bean, we have orange fresh sweet potato, we have rich iron beans, we have uh, grain amaranth, we have what we call mukene. And our farmers have also been looking for markets in order to be sustained in production. Agrofinancing and market access are still some of the most crucial components to transformation of smallholder farmers as the subsector upholds contribution towards sustainable food and agro-production. Rona Nahawe compiled this story. Verily, indeed. Many thanks for being part of business today, wherever you've been catching us from. We have three minutes to ten o'clock. It is the 22nd of June's live broadcast here at Port 42 Nile Avenue. I'm Joram Paul Sonko with Winnie Buyinza Nakauchi on for the sign language interpretation. Don't forget to introduce her at the start of the bulletin. Have a good night.